Okay, we'll try again. Oh, it's working. Well, it's been a long day, hasn't it? But it's been a good day. And how many of you are here for the first time today? We didn't get to hear the earlier presentation. There's quite a few, Des. And uh, Irv Taylor will say more about the DVDs and CDs that will be available of the early service and this one. But we welcome you on behalf of Campus Hill Church to this program, the second in a two-part series that's um, actually presented by the journal Adventist Today. So would you join me in prayer? Dear Father, as we come to the, this new week at the end of the Sabbath, we're reminded again of the rest that we have in Jesus Christ, the uh, wonderful rest that only the cross could bring, the rest that allows us to put all of our sins behind us and know that they've been handled by you and by Jesus. We pray tonight that as uh, Dr. Ford continues to speak his heartfelt convictions, that your spirit will speak through him. We pray that you will give him health and energy and penetrating clarity in the things that really count. And we thank you for Jesus and pray that you will bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Larry, I'm going to have to struggle to get up. Thank you very much. Give me this um, when I'm up. Again, on the behalf of the Adventist Today Foundation, the uh, publisher of Adventist Today, I'd like to welcome you to the evening presentation for Dr. Ford. Um, for those of you who are here in the afternoon, uh, I have mentioned it there is uh, that th these presentations by the Adventist Today Foundation was with the kind collaboration of the Loma Linda Campus Hill Church, and we're proud to be able to sponsor this presentation by such a distinguished scholar and evangelist. Uh, Dr. Ford is not only well known internationally in the Adventist community, but also in the larger evangelical Christian community, as you know. Uh, his published works, both scholarly and those intended for a more general readership, are more extensive and impressive for the impact they have made for understanding a number of important topics, both in Christian and in Adventist thought. Uh, his challenging and, to some, controversial theological odyssey within the Adventist church community has been chronicled in a number of publications, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Uh, as we noted this afternoon, the most complete and detailed summary of Dr. Ford's life and the facts surrounding his personal and theological odyssey has recently appeared in a book, uh, Desmond Ford, Reformist Theologian, Gospel Revivalist by fellow Australian, Dr. Milton Hook and the Adventist Today Foundation is proud to be the publisher of that work. Uh, I also, as I mentioned this afternoon, I want to make sure that everyone aware of that, uh, that the um, funds received from the, from the sale of these publications, uh, Dr. Ford receives no remuneration, and neither from the, the books or from the DVDs or CDs of his remarks today. The uh, following Dr. Ford's presentation will be an opportunity for questions from the audience, and when uh, there will be an opportunity where the cards will be distributed, as we did this afternoon. I want to wish, uh, welcome Dr. Ford to his second, second presentation today. As we mentioned this afternoon, he undertook a very long airplane ride across the Pacific, and just as he was recovering from uh, very serious effects of an upper respiratory infection, so we very much appreciate him being with us here today. Let me mention also again that the DVD, the video, and the CD, the audio, of the presentation he made this afternoon is available, if you wish it, uh, on your way out today, uh, uh, tonight. And the um, CD and DVDs of the panel and this evening's presentation will be available in about a week. Uh, if you'd like to um, obtain those, you can go on the Adventist Today website and they'll be available there. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Desmond Ford, who will address the subject, 
This I believe. Dr. Ford. The only people who can move the world are the people whom the world cannot move. They all have one characteristic. They rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory every day because they know the apostolic gospel. But in contrast, take an aged man on the threshold of death who does not know who he is, doesn't belong to anybody, sees no meaning in life and confronting his final exit, <coughs> no joy for him, no glory for him, only despair. So my question tonight is, do the first group have good grounds for being full of joy unspeakable and full of glory? I want you to imagine <coughs> you're being shown into a new house, a gift house for you, and in the main room you see a very strange object about the same size as yourself, but it's got no label. You've got no idea what it's for. Obviously very complex. Obviously the product of genius. But what on earth is it for? <clears throat> when I talked to my grandchildren originally, I would say, what are these for? Oh, Grandpa, eyes are for seeing. And what are these for? Grandpa, ears are for hearing. And what about these? What silly questions you ask. Lips for eating and for talking. All right, now here's the real question. And I point to them, the whole person, I say, what are you for? What are you for? They don't know. There are certain questions that must be answered by every sane person if they are to avoid being suicidal, a workaholic, an alcoholic, or something similar. The questions are, who am I? Why am I here? How should I live? Is the universe friendly? How should I deal with suffering? And with the thought of my inevitable mortality? If a person can't answer these questions, their life will take a nosedive ultimately. But how do you answer them? Omar Khayyam, the Persian poet, said, myself when young, did oft frequent both doctor and saint and heard great argument. But evermore I came out the same door as in I went. Of course. They were pooling their ignorance. All reasoning that's not of faith is based on unprovable axioms. Study of epistemology emphasizes that. All thinking based on foundations can't be demonstrated. In the last 30 years, Something very strange has happened that you've heard about often. 
scientists have discovered the fine-tuning of the universe. That there are scores of parameters so finely balanced, even if they differed by a hair's breadth, the universe would disintegrate. You've heard of Francis Collins, who cared for 2,400 scientists nearly 10 years on the Genome Project. He debated Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion. It was recorded in one of the Time magazines, November 2006. And he said to Dawkins, as a scientist, I know of at least 15 parameters, which if they differed unimaginably slightly, you and I wouldn't be here. He said the gravitational constant, if it differed by one in a hundred million, we wouldn't be here. Well, there are lots of them. Roger Penrose, world-famous physicist from Oxford, says the possibility of our world and universe coming together by chance is one in 10 billion to the 123rd. Please remember the number of grains of sand on the seashores, 10 to 25. Number of atoms in the universe, 10 to the 80th. But the possibility of this world and universe coming together by chance is 10 billion to the 124th. And when Stephen Jay Gould, who was a great writer and a great scientist, professed a love for Darwin, but he really sapped the foundations of Darwinism. I was punctuated equilibrium, punk eek. He said the human brain is the result of 50 billion coincidences. And I'm inclined to say, Mr. Gould, Mr. Gould, Mr. Gould, I think there are 50 billion chances that you're way out. <laughs> way out. The only answer to the fine-tuning of the universe has been the multiverse theory. And the men who invented it have given it up. It has not worn well. Many scientific studies reject the multi-universe theory. But let's come away from science to something that belongs to your heart, your home, your church. <clears throat> In the little word ought lies our mercy and our misery. But you can't live without oughts. If you say there ought not to be any oughts, you've still got them. If this is a naturalistic universe, and if we are only animals, there's nothing wrong with murder, or rape, or pillage. They're perfectly natural pursuits for animals. But you and I know there's a difference between right and wrong. Agnostics know it. Atheists know it. I have a very close relative, very upright man, but an atheist. But he's so strict about right and wrong. If I even want to walk in an area where he thinks is forbidden, he won't let me go. Even atheists believe in right and wrong. <clears throat> but if there's no God, saying you don't believe in murder is no different to saying you don't believe in spinach. No difference. Moralists are agreed that right and wrong has no meaning unless there's a God. No power. But now let me come to the real reason why I think our friends who can rejoice with joy unspeakable and full and glory are right. One word, <coughs> Christ. Socrates, Plato, 
Aristotle together taught for 130 years. Christ taught for three and a half. When you read Plato, Socrates, not that Socrates wrote anything, but his reports, Aristotle has 800 books to his credit by his disciples. They're full of a lot of rubbish, as well as some good things. I've had to do study in them. But no one yet has found anything to find fault with in the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. He omitted the false, the temporal, and the trivial. He only enlarged on the things that are eternal and of universal importance. How does a Jewish teacher do that? <clears throat> on one occasion he pointed to the heavens, the sun shining brilliantly. He said, heaven and earth pass away. But my words will never pass away. How on earth did he know? I have about 7,000 books left, many in America. <coughs> I have all the great thinkers, writers represented. None of them ever said, as long as there's a sun above, moon and stars, my words will be known and taught and echoed. On another occasion, he said, the stone the builders rejected will become the headstone of the corner. He was to be the head of the temple of truth through the ages. Well, he has been, and he is. How did he know? How did he know? But we mainly believe in Jesus, not because of his prophecies, but because his words fit our hearts as a key fits the lock when we're weary and heavy burdened, only Jesus can help. When we're deeply troubled, we read in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. <clears throat> His words fit the human heart as though he made the human heart. And of course he did. What then are the main teachings of Jesus of Nazareth? Not about force like Muhammad. Not about racial superiority. But here are his main themes. They're all found in one place. Matthew 16. When the confession was made, thou art the Christ, Jesus went on to say, yes, and upon this rock, this truth, I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And then he spoke about when people were rejoicing at that, he said, but soon I am to be crucified. And that was a bit of a letdown. But then he said, I'm coming back again. Please note, the things that Christ thought were important, the Christ, the Messiah, the Saviour, the Church, the Cross, the Coming. I'm not sure whether our evangelistic programs could follow that and get away with it with their conference leaders. The Christ, the church, the cross, the coming. And what sort of a Christ? We talked about it this afternoon. He came as a true son of man and sin is no part of true humanity. Don't let anyone tell you that he had my propensities to sin and yours. Sin is no part of true humanity and he's the only true man that's come since Adam. 
And what sort of a man? <clears throat> Remember Paul said, I determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. What? Nothing? Paul, you were educated at the feet of Gamaliel. You come from the University of Tarsus. You can't just be interested in one man. Who said anything about a man? I determined to know nothing <coughs> save Christ. He would never have said that about an angel. I determined to know nothing except Gabriel. Oh no. Oh no. Who was this man? Who on a cross could be as calm as if walking a summer pavement and give away heaven? Who was this man? Who was this man? He was my saviour. He was your saviour. The church, Ellen White had it right in Acts of the Apostles when she said from the beginning of time all faithful souls are members of the church. New Testament knows nothing about denominations. I in creedal positions am very much a Seventh-day Adventist but I'm first a Christian. I'm a member of a church that has no borders, that takes in Roman Catholics and Presbyterians and Methodists, all who love Jesus and believe that he was God's provision in vicarious sacrifice for their sins. All who love Jesus. You say, what? You can include people with all sorts of errors? Well, when I include Adventists, I do that. <laughs> you know, all our teaching of historicism on prophetic themes and setting dates, our scholars have known for decades that's all wrong. William Miller was a great Christian. God used him to revive the second advent premillennial hope. God used him, great man, but not a great scholar and not even a great mathematician. And almost all our dates like 538, 508, 1798, 1844, they all come from Billy Miller. And he's wrong in all of them. He's wrong in all of them. There is no evidence of papal supremacy from 538 to 1798. That's just not true. Ask any historian. There was papal supremacy for two to three centuries, around the 11th century or so. It's just not true, all we said about 538 to 1798. That's a hangover from Miller, and Miller was wrong. All the stuff we said on the trumpets... French Revolution and Revelation 11, United States and Revelation 13, none of it's correct. When I walked with Cottrell <coughs> around Tacoma Park in the 1950s and told him my problems with Adventist interpretation of prophecy, he had all the same problems. So he went to Elder Nickel, he said, what do we do? This one on 814, he said. None of our scholars believe it. Nickel said, write to all the scholars who know Hebrew and Greek and ask them. All 27 came back and said, you can't prove an investigative judgment or an 1844 out of Daniel 814. So if you say to me, Des, you'd include in the church People who have all sorts of errors? Yes, because I love the Adventists. And I love the Catholics. And the Presbyterians. And the Plymouth Brethren. I will love any man or woman that loves Jesus. And that believes through Christ alone we can have eternal life. You know, Hans Kung, somewhat of a heretic, 
but I've come to know one or two of them. <clears throat> this is what he said about the church of the future. To what kind of Christian, to what kind of church does the future belong? Not to a church that's lazy, shallow, indifferent, timid and weak in its faith. Not to a church that expects blind obedience and fanatical party loyalty. Not to a church that's a slave of its own history, always putting on the brakes, suspiciously defensive, and yet in the end forced into agreement. Not to a church that's anti-critical, practically anti-intellectual and dilettantish. Not to a church that's blind to problems, suspicious of empirical knowledge, yet claiming competent authority for everyone and everything. Not to a church that's quarrelsome, impatient and unfair in dialogue. Not to a church that's closed to the real world. In short, the future does not belong to a church that's dishonest. No, the future belongs to a church that knows what it does not know. To a church that relies upon God's grace and wisdom and has in its weakness and ignorance a radical confidence in God. A church that's strong in faith, joyous and certain, yet self-critical. A church filled with intellectual desire, spontaneity, animation, fruitfulness. To a church that has the courage of initiative and the courage to take risks. To a church that's altogether open to the real world. In short, the future belongs to a thoroughly truthful church. There's a big difference between a movement and a church. God raised up the Adventist movement. I believe that with all my heart. There are many wonderful things in Adventism. I see in the Seventh-day Sabbath and its rest a beautiful parable of the rest of conscience. All those in joy who know the gospel, we who have believed who enter into rest. Adam's first whole day was a rest day. First thing God gives you when you come to him is rest of heart. Sabbath is a sign of that. I love the doctrine of life only in Christ. All good things are only in Christ. Anthony Flew, the greatest of modern atheists, for 50 years a lecturer against God, intellectual father Richard Dawkins and most other contemporary atheists, has been converted to theism not to Christianity. Why not? He says, I can't stomach the doctrine of eternal torment. We Adventists could help him, couldn't we? I thank God for our teaching of life only in Christ. That's a God-given truth. I thank God for the teaching that the body is the temple of God. I would have been buried years ago but for reading in Ellen White that the nerve of God, the law of God <coughs> is written on every nerve and sinew and fibre of our being, the boy who read that loved to eat garbage, sweets from the stores, refined biscuits, read novels for hours at a time while swallowing goodies. And suddenly I read, hey, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Oh, I owe so much to Adventism. I'd have been dead many years ago. I'm not naturally temperate at anything. Ask my wife. All my relatives always tell me, slow down, stop it. You know, I'm just not naturally temperate. I have the temperament of a hyperthyroid squirrel and it would kill me but for the Adventist message. <laughs> it would indeed. And I am grateful for the pastoral leadership 
of Ellen White. I cannot use Ellen White as a Bible. She forbids it. She made mistakes in science, in history and theology, but she made no mistake when she painted Jesus as she did in the book Desire of Ages. And when I first read the last book I would give to a modern Adventist youth, messages to young people, finishing it off under an electric light outside the home of the Adventist teacher who had lent me this book, when I first read it, I was swept off my feet by its high ideals. But what concerned me the most was I wasn't an alcoholic, but I was a fiction-aholic. I read in picture theatre intervals. Matter of fact, the last pages of life sketches I read in an interval when they were showing the picture of Dorian Gray. I read on trains, on trams, in poor lighting when I was waiting for my mother to come home and I was just a teenager. So I was a fictionaholic. I'd have been good for no university work, whatever. But that book with its ideals led me to give up fiction. A bit too extreme, because sometimes good fiction is better than the most preaching. <laughs> but for me, I couldn't risk the old ways. And as a result, I've been able to work in three universities and I've been able to write about 30 books and so on. But I owe it to the pastoral leadership of Ellen White. But I will not use her as a Bible. I became a rebel Adventist by reading the chapters in the book Council on Writers and Editors where she said, we've got much to learn and much to unlearn. And those who think they'll never have to change a cherished view will be disappointed. God sees our leading men have need of greater light. <clears throat> Good stuff. Made me a rebel. I had a funny experience at, Mich at uh, the university in England that I went. Getting tired, the name escapes me. But F.F. F. Bruce was my tutor. No classes, but he supervised what I wrote. And I had to deal with what's known as a crux interpretum, a difficult passage of scripture where none of the scholars could have come to agreement. It was what they call the catacomb, the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians 2. He that letteth will let till it be taken out of the way. Very mysterious. Spent months on it. I had to give a whole chapter on it. Manchester University, this one. And then my mind went back to my battles with Robert Brinsmead. Robert and I have been friendly enemies for decades. From 1960 on, I was fighting Bob. And after Glacier View, the first thing I wrote was an answer to his anti sabbatarian diatribes. That's too strong a word. He wrote the strongest arguments against the Sabbath I have ever seen. He's a very, very intelligent man and I pray for him often. We're still good friends. But anyway, I remembered how when I landed back from Michigan State University, <coughs> Bob was into all sorts of stuff in eschatology. So I read everything from Ellen White on eschatology that I could get. Everything. And when I came across this problem of the catacomb in 2 Thessalonians 2, suddenly I remembered that all the various views of the scholars, the Germans, the French, the English, the Americans, they all offered one part of a gestalt picture that Ellen White gave. I can't enlarge on that now. 
But when I wrote this up for F.F. F. Bruce, and he was the greatest evangelical scholar of the century, he said, if you're asked on what grounds, what contribution to knowledge should lead to you getting a doctorate, he said, point to this. So I refused to use Ellen White as a Bible. She forbade it. She had mistakes in theology and history, science. Her main purpose was to tell people to be like Jesus. 1947, I spent time with her secretary of decades before. I said, what sort of a woman was this Ellen White? Oh, she said, very kind. Very kind, very sensible, very generous. Now this lady was someone I respected. And then in the next 10 years or so, I met other people who either lived with or knew Ellen White. I gave the same sort of report. And so I make many enemies because I'll not consign Ellen White to damnation. And I make many enemies because I will not follow Ellen White and everything she wrote. She told the brethren, don't quote my writings as long as you live till you know what the Bible says. She said, there's no extra truth in the testimonies. So if there's anything in the testimonies that can't be supported from scripture, forget it. I could go on and on about why I love the church, but I am aware of its flaws. And looking at my own heart, I realise the trouble with the church is a lot of me's, a lot of those Ford's, and we're all fallible, all human. So the doctrine of the church means the body of all believers, not a denomination. Then Jesus went on to talk about the cross. And again I remind you, from a third to a half of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, it was about the week of the cross. Paul determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Read the first two chapters of 1 Corinthians 2. He said it's foolishness to the world, but to us it's the power of God. The cross where the world was crucified to me and to you, where we were crucified to the world, where Christ was crucified for us all. There is a green hill far away outside a city wall where the dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all. We may not know, we cannot tell what pain he had to bear. We only know it was for us. He hung and suffered there. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. Only he could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. The cross tells us how to live and how to die. The cross is the centre of our hope. I see there one who was my representative and my substitute and all he did is put to my account, mine, mine are Christ living and dying as though I'd lived his life, died his death. And then there's the coming. You know there was a book written not long ago by Martin Rees British Astronomer Royal, called Our Final Century. Sound like an Adventist evangelist. He said there's only a 50-50 chance civilization will survive this century. Get it, read it. Have your ministers read it. Our Final Century by Martin Rees, one of the greatest scientists of the world. 50 cent chance, he says, that this is not the final generation. The second coming is very precious 
because with it comes the resurrection of the dead. That didn't mean much to me till I lost the wife of my youth. Now it means a great deal to me. A great deal. And the older I get, more of my friends are hanging on like leaves on a well-nigh barren tree. And I don't know whether I or they will be the first down. So the second coming is very important because it's linked with the resurrection. Now I want to finalise by a very quick summary of my creed. A very quick summary of the Christian Church's creed. It's found in the seven sayings from the cross. Father, forgive them. The basic doctrine of the Christian church is the forgiveness of sins. Not the papal antichrist. Not even the Sabbath. Not spiritual gifts. Oh no. Oh no. The basic doctrine of the Christian church is the forgiveness of sins. Which is constant because justification isn't just at the beginning it's over us all the time, a never-ending donation of mercy and forgiveness and acceptance. God says, my child, you stumbled, you're sorry, but I love you still. Let's walk together. The second saying from the cross, you'll be with me in paradise. There is a world to come. There is a heaven to win. It's a reality. Then in the third saying, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother, Mary is a symbol of the church and Christ is saying, you members of the church, care for her. And he's saying to the church and its leaders, care for your children. Care for your children. Then the middle saying of the seven is the most important. My God. My God, why should you forsake me? The sun hides its face. This is the one who's sweat blood in Gethsemane. This is the one who has made a curse for you and me. This is the one who's offering himself as a holy sacrifice, a sweet smelling savour to God because it supports God's love for his universe and God's resolve to sustain it and to support it and to show that evil cannot be tolerated, that all sin brings its punishment, but that Christ took the punishment, made a curse for us, made sin for us, so the middle saying of the seven, that's the heart of the gospel. Christ my substitute. Christ my representative. Forsaken that you and I might never be forsaken. Then his speech flashes light upon the scene. And he says that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He says, I thirst. Here's the next item of the creed. The reliability of the scriptures. Not verbal inspiration, infallibility. The Bible makes no such claim. The Bible's inspiration is perfect for its purpose. These are written that you might know that Jesus is the Christ and by believing have life. Do you get that? Don't fight over a theory of inspiration. That's the only theory that'll hold water. The inspiration of the Bible is perfect for its purpose. The Bible's not an inquire within upon everything. It's not a scientific textbook, not intending to give everything from history. Everything there ministers to the one purpose. These are written. You might know Jesus is the Christ. And then in the next saying, it is finished. That's glorious. I would not work my soul to save. That the Lord has done. 
It's finished. But I'd work like any slave for love of God's dear son. To run and work the law commands but gives me neither feet nor hands. But better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. The law says, this do and you shall live. The gospel says, live and you'll do. The law says, pay me what you owe. The gospel says, I frankly forgive you everything. The law says, wages of sin is death. The gospel says, the gift of God's eternal life. And where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. The law says, make you a new heart. The gospel says, a new heart I'll give you. The law says, thou shalt love. The gospel says, herein is love, not that we love God, but he loved us. Thou shalt love. So it's finished, it's done. Nothing in 1844 could add to that. The burden of the world's sin of past, present and future was rolled into Joseph's new tomb. And when, it, when Christ came from the tomb, it meant everybody on earth had been justified. If there was one person whose sin Christ did not bear, he'd still be in the tomb. He was delivered for our offences, but raised again for our justification. It's finished. The resurrection was the testimony the sign that it's done. You don't have to worry about how to get right with God. <clears throat> He's already reconciled to us. He says, be ye reconciled. Accept it. Receive it. Remember, he's better than we've ever suspected, though we're worse. Remember, only God has given away. Only heaven can be had for the asking. Everything else is nailed down. Nothing for nothing and very little for a dollar. Only God is given away. Only heaven can be had for the asking. It's finished. It's done. Receive it. If we could earn it, he need never have died. Trying to earn righteousness is like spitting into the ocean to raise its level. Trying to make yourself better is like trying to eat soup with a fork. It has to be a gift. It's free. It's done. It's been worked out. Accept it. And then finally, Father, into thy hands I commit my life. The word used for commit means to deposit as in a bank with the certainty you'll get it back again. Dear friends, God has been wonderfully good to me. I'm a stumbling, bumbling, erring Christian. I do nothing altogether right. But I've known God for 60 years and he has been so good. I've given you my creed. I believe in the Christ whom Paul said he wanted to know above all else. I believe in the cross where he took your guilt and mine. I believe in the church, the company of believers in the cross. I believe in the coming when we'll all go home together. Sorry. Thank you very much, Dr. Ford. We're going to take our break.
to pass the plates for our offering, but they all have the reason basically is because they have cards in them um, where you can write your questions. Um, if the people who are going to have those can come forward. If you can write your questions, we'll take about five minutes to give you an opportunity to do that. We would very much appreciate uh, any of your um, supporting with your offerings, the expenses for Dr. Ford's uh, visit with us.